Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a PragerU video in which they compare atheism to a belief in God in order to determine which is more rational. Of course, as I've discussed on this channel before, there are multiple potential definitions of the word rational, so an action could be considered both rational and irrational simultaneously depending on which definition you're using. But generally, I would suggest that given the lack of evidence for any particular god, and the god claim as a whole resting on logical argumentation that is fundamentally flawed rather than any sort of empirical evidence, atheism is the more rational position to hold. And of course, this comes with the caveat that not all atheists are rational and not all theists are irrational, and there are varying degrees of rationality and irrationality that can be found both among theists and atheists, but I feel like I've already applied more nuance than PragerU is capable of, so let's see what they have to say. Is it rational to believe in God? Many people think that faith and reason are opposites. Not necessarily opposites, but faith is definitely the inferior method of acquiring knowledge. To the best of my knowledge, faith has never once been the foundation for any tangible advancement of human knowledge. You can call me when faith starts becoming a demonstrably good method for coming to actual knowledge of some kind. That belief in God and tough-minded logical reasoning are like oil and water. They are wrong. Belief in God is far more rational than atheism. How so? Can God be demonstrated to actually exist? If so, which God? How is one to decide, of the myriad of gods out there, which is the correct one? And when it turns out that all God beliefs share the same flawed argumentation for the general existence of God and then make unjustified logical leaps to get to their specific God, would the rational decision here not be to withhold belief until someone actually demonstrates that their specific God exists? Logic can show that there is a God. So far, I have yet to see a logical argument for God that does not rely completely on unfounded assertions. And we're talking about an all-powerful being here that, depending on your view, supposedly wants a personal relationship with us. Even if the arguments were not flawed, why would we expect such a being to rely on logical argumentation instead of just showing up himself and putting the matter to rest? I have never heard an adequate response to that. It's usually something along the lines of preserving free will, as if it weren't possible to know something exists for sure and not automatically love that thing and want a relationship with it, or else it's that God, for whatever reason, won't initiate the relationship and is waiting for you to initiate it. But supposedly he loves us, and the only thing that is going to save us from eternal damnation is a relationship with him, so the best way to accomplish that would be to initiate the relationship himself and then see how we respond to it, instead of pretending to not exist until we decide that he does. Which, coincidentally, is the exact same behavior you would expect of a god that doesn't actually exist. If you look at the universe with common sense and an open mind, you'll find that it's full of God's fingerprints. And that's really a significant part of the problem, isn't it? Common sense is almost as bad as faith when it comes to relying on it for knowledge about the universe. Common sense is basically just insight gained through confirmation bias. As an example, in a survey of Australians on climate change, when they were asked which best describes what your opinion about climate change is based on, 23.1% of respondents answered common sense. This included people with all views on climate change, from those who believe that it is not happening, to those who believe it is happening but is a natural phenomenon, to those who believe it is being driven by human activity. Though notably, the group that is demonstrably wrong was the group in which the largest proportion of respondents gave common sense as the basis for their opinion, 36.6% with only 11.3% saying it was based on scientific research, while the group that is demonstrably correct had the smallest proportion of respondents say common common sense was the basis for the reasoning, while 48.5% of them said it was scientific research. Almost as though scientific research is a better method for discovering truth about reality than common sense. A good place to start is with an argument by Thomas Aquinas, the great 13th century philosopher and theologian. The argument starts with the not very startling observation that things move, but nothing moves for no reason. Something must cause that movement. 
and whatever caused that must be caused by something else, and so on. But this causal chain cannot go backwards forever. It must have a beginning. There must be an unmoved mover to begin all the motion in the universe. This is an argument that you don't see very often anymore. There's a reason for that. Do you know what that is? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with Isaac Newton. So things move, and things that move are moved by other things. Therefore, there had to be a prime mover. That prime mover is God. Never mind the huge jump from prime mover to specifically the Christian God, but from Newton we learned that an object at rest will remain at rest unless an external force is exerted upon it, and an object in motion will stay in motion unless an external force is exerted upon it. So things in the universe move. Does this require a prime mover? Well, that depends on the initial state of the universe. Was it a state of motion or of rest? We don't have enough data to say for sure, but given the fact that things move, we can reasonably infer that it was a state of motion. Also, something something quantum mechanics something. Newtonian physics likely wouldn't have been applicable before the Big Bang, so spontaneous motion isn't off the table at this point. A first domino to start the whole chain moving, since mere matter never moves itself. Okay, even if I grant the argument up until this point, that mere matter never moves itself line is just pure garbage. Why, I am made up of mere matter right now and I'm moving my own fingers as I type this script. Or rather, I'm flailing my arms around more than you would think I need to as I record this audio. It seems silly, but it actually helps my voice sound more expressive. Unless you mean that matter requires energy in order to move. I grant that, but as matter is basically solidified energy, the release of energy caused by atoms of matter being split could count as mere matter moving itself. In fact, anything that moves because of electricity that is generated at a nuclear reactor could be said to be mere matter moving because of mere matter being split. A modern objection to this argument is that some movements in quantum mechanics, radioactive decay for example, have no discernible cause. Sure. We have examples of motion with no cause, therefore the assertion that all motion is caused by other motion is demonstrably incorrect. But hang on a second. Just because scientists don't see a cause doesn't mean there isn't one. Right, though all indication is that nuclear decay is a completely stochastic process. That is, it's a fundamentally random process. It is slightly possible that we will in the future be able to figure out which atoms will decay when, but it's not looking very likely. But until such a time as we have some information as to what that cause may be, or whether it even exists, just saying we don't know it isn't there, therefore it must be there, is assertion and speculation based on the argument from ignorance. We don't know, therefore God. We don't know for sure that there isn't a cause, therefore there is a cause, therefore the argument works. Like I said, the arguments for God are flawed. When you take the time to examine them, they always end up at assertions and arguments from ignorance. It just means science hasn't found it yet. And hypothetically, if we were to just accept your argument here and say it's God, would that help us learn more about the universe? Or would it stop the scientific research in its tracks? Using God as a scientific answer can only ever cause science to come up short of what it is actually capable of. Also, we have no reason to think that radioactive decay is not actually random. There doesn't appear to be any causal factors as to which specific atoms decay at what time. We know how long it will take for half of them to decay, but which half seems to be random. Maybe someday they will. But then there will have to be a new cause to explain that one. And so on and so on. Why? The scientific consensus today is that radioactive decay is uncaused, Future Rhino cutting in with a clarification. When I say uncaused here, I don't mean that the process of radioactive decay is itself uncaused. Decay is caused by quantum tunneling and the interaction of the forces within the atom itself, and I'm not going into detail on that right now. But specifically, which atom will decay at which moment in time does appear to be truly random. Not random like a roll of the dice, where if you knew every single physical interaction between the dice and their environment, you could predict which number will face up, but truly random. And now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Scientists are still working to verify that, ultimately it is impossible to definitively prove that, but if we find one more causal link, 
Who's to say that that one wouldn't be the fundamental cause with no further links in the chain? How can you possibly speculate about what the properties of this hypothetical non-existent cause would have to be? And really, if your argument from God relies on future scientists hypothetically finding a cause for which there is no current indication, and then even more future scientists finding a cause for that cause, then can you really say that your argument is more than speculation? I can do that too. One day, scientists will discover the ultimate origin of the universe, and it will not be God. Would you be happy with this hypothetical? If not, why would you expect me to be happy with your hypothetical? How about we restrict our arguments to things that are actually known now, and not things that we may hypothetically know in the future? But science will never find the first cause. How do you know that? How could you possibly know that? I didn't realize that PragerU had detailed knowledge of all future scientific discoveries. Maybe you should help the world out by sharing some of these future scientific advances instead of just being argumentative on YouTube. Oh, what's that? You don't actually have access to all future scientific discoveries and as such cannot reasonably assert facts about what science will or will not discover in the future? Huh. Maybe in your video about how belief in God is more rational than atheism, you shouldn't predicate your belief in God on your guess about what may be happening in the future of scientific progress. That's no knock on science. It simply means that a first cause lies outside the realm of science. Do you have a reason for us to accept that conclusion as true? Like, a good rational reason? Or is this video on how rational belief in God is compared to atheism just going to rely on irrational speculation about the future? Like, I would agree that there are definitions of rationality by which it is possible to say that a belief in God is rational, but this ain't it. Another way to explain this argument is that everything that begins must have a cause. Ah, now you're trying to sneak the Kalam cosmological argument into it. Well, do you have an example of something that truly began to exist in the same sense as the universe? No, you don't. Everything within the universe is a reconfiguration of previously existing materials, and it is possible, according to some cosmological models, that even the universe itself is a reconfiguration of previously existing materials, but even if the universe began out of nothing, we have no other examples of such a beginning, and so we cannot draw conclusions about what is required for such a beginning. If that is the case, then as of yet we can't even study the one example of it that we do have. So how can we possibly draw any firm conclusions from an area with so many unknowns? I know it's intuitive, it appeals to common sense, but as we've seen, this is not a good way of figuring out how stuff really works in reality. It's just a good way of confirming what we already believe. Nothing can come from nothing. How do you know? Oh yeah, the common sense thing. Well, have scientists ever been able to examine nothing? Have we ever sampled nothing in order to study it? Have you determined that quantum fluctuations would be deterred from showing up in nothing? Have you determined that nothing is stable? Maybe nothing is just too unstable to continue existing, and so universes will spontaneously form. All you have here is an appeal to intuition. Intuitively, it doesn't make sense that nothing would be unstable. But the reality is that we can't say whether or not nothing would be unstable unless we have been able to examine it to determine its properties. But it's nothing, the apologist says. Nothing doesn't have any properties. Which would also mean that nothing cannot be stable. Stability is a property, just as instability is a property. So I could use that to say that nothing cannot be stable, as stability is a property, therefore nothing will spontaneously create something by virtue of the fact that it cannot have the property of stability. But I'd just be talking out my ass because I've never been able to examine nothing to determine how it would behave. Because nobody has, so any assertions about it are simply that. Assertions. And what's more, apologists can't even demonstrate that there actually was a time when nothing existed. There are many models of the universe that don't have a beginning, and many more that have a beginning but not from nothing. So if there's no first cause, there can't be second causes. Or anything at all. So the infinite regress has to end at a brute fact. You choose to call this brute fact God on the grounds that there can't be an infinite regress. Why doesn't God need a cause? Who the fuck knows? I choose not to resort to magic as the explanation when science doesn't know the answer. Maybe the brute fact is energy. Energy has always existed in some form or another, and as energy is capable of providing motion, I don't see how this is a problem for a first cause. That seems just as reasonable, some might even say rational, as the god explanation, if not more so. 
In other words, if there's no creator, there can't be a universe. Creator is loaded language. If there isn't a first cause, there can't be a universe is the best that this argument can do. We just disagree on what that cause is, and I suggest a cause that does not require a bunch of extra assumptions on top. But what if the universe were infinitely old, you might ask? It isn't. Nobody's claiming that it is. Some are claiming that the cosmos, of which our universe is a part, is infinitely old, but our local instantiation of space-time is about 13.8 billion years old, which I'm sure you'll recognize is a bit less than infinity. And the fact that apologists feel the need to address this straw man objection rather than any of the actual objections is quite telling. So let me guess, the laws of thermodynamics preclude an infinitely old universe because if the universe was existing for an infinite amount of time in the past, then it would be in a state of maximum entropy, which it is not, therefore it can't be infinite, right? Well, that relies on the steady state model of the universe, which was pretty definitively ruled out in the 1960s, with plenty of slightly less definitive data points indicating that it was incorrect accumulating before then. Well, all scientists today agree that the universe is not infinitely old, that it had a beginning in the Big Bang. Oh, right, sure. The scientific consensus is important to you now, but when it comes to the cause of radioactive decay, you have to appeal to a hypothetical future scientific consensus that overturns the current consensus. But yeah, the Big Bang is a thing. Boy, don't ever say that again. If the universe had a beginning, then it didn't have to exist. Who said anything about it having to exist? Why does something having a beginning somehow mean that that thing did not have to exist? How are those two things connected? This seems like another assertion to me. And things which don't have to exist must have a cause. Okay, so let's, let's, let's try to recap at this point. Let's rephrase the argument up to this point. Things that move have to be moved by something else except for radioactive decay, but future scientists will find a cause for that that fits the argument, but they won't be able to find a first cause. Therefore, there was a first cause, and things that begin to exist have a cause. Scientists agree that the universe began to exist, and because it had a beginning, it did not have to exist, and things that don't have to exist only exist if they have a cause, therefore God? Did I get that right? And this is the rational position? Also, side note, completely irrelevant to the argument, but the little animation that they're using for the Big Bang looks like a butthole that needs medical attention. There's confirmation of this argument from Big Bang cosmology. We now know that all matter, that is, the whole universe, came into existence some 13.7 billion years ago, and it's been expanding and cooling ever since. Yes, but what came before the Big Bang? We don't know. We have several hypotheses about the matter that can answer the question in many different ways, but no god is indicated by any of the data that we have at this point. No scientist doubts that anymore. Even though, before it was scientifically proved, atheists called it creationism in disguise. I'd need you to actually provide some names or actual article titles or something for this one. The only thing I'm finding when I search for that exact headline is some guy named Michael Rivero who's posting a blog article with the same title everywhere he can about how the Big Bang is wrong, but scientists are trying to make it fit their preconceived notions, just like medieval scientists did with the epicycles that were an attempt to explain retrograde motion when they thought the Earth was the center of the universe, with everything rotating around it. So, unless you want to be associated with crackpots like that, you're gonna need to, like, I don't know, provide a better headline or something. Now, sure, the Big Bang was not just accepted right off the bat with no challenge. In fact, the name Big Bang was coined by Fred Hoyle as a derisive term that he used to make fun of it as an absurd idea. But such is often the case with scientific advances. You have supporters and detractors, and often they can be very passionate about their position. But in this case, the data supported the Big Bang model, so that's the one that won. Now, add to this premise a very logical second premise, the principle of causality, that nothing begins without an adequate cause. That one I can accept. The universe had an adequate cause. But the assumption that this cause has to be God is completely unjustified at this time. And you get the conclusion that since there was a Big Bang, there must be a Big Banger. No, you get to the conclusion, since our local instantiation of space-time began, there must have been a cause adequate for this beginning. It says nothing about the nature of that cause, or whether that cause wants a personal relationship with you. Also, Big Banger was my nickname in high school.
No, it wasn't. That was a lie. But is this Big Banger God? Why couldn't it be just another universe? Mm, just another universe is not how cosmologists would choose to describe it, I'm sure. But really, at this time, our ideas are all hypothetical, so drawing any non-tentative conclusions about what happened before the Big Bang would be irrational. Because Einstein's general theory of relativity says that all time is relative to matter. Okay, maybe I have this wrong, I don't specialize in relativity by any stretch of the imagination, but isn't it more that time is relative to your frame of reference? And since all matter began 13.7 billion years ago, so did all time. So there's no time before the Big Bang. Whether time and matter are interconnected in such a fashion as it is impossible for one to exist without the other is a matter of conjecture and debate, but the question is not answered by general relativity. Suffice it to say for now that there are models of the universe that posit the idea that, as we look back in time and approach the very beginning, time will actually give way to space, meaning that there was a point in the universe's history where there was space but no time. And of course, there wouldn't have been matter then, it would have all been in the form of energy. In this model, the question of the ultimate beginning of the universe becomes meaningless, as without the existence of time, the concept of a beginning becomes incoherent. And forgive me, but when it comes to matters of theoretical physics and cosmology, I'll take the words of theoretical physicists and cosmologists like Stephen Hawking over a professor of philosophy who seems intent on either misunderstanding or misrepresenting the arguments. And even if there is time before the Big Bang, even if there is a multiverse, that is, many universes with many Big Bangs, as string theory says is mathematically possible, that too must have a beginning. Why? How did you determine that? Is this another one of those appeals to common sense, or do you have some data to back you up on this? Sean Carroll's model basically has the arrow of time reversing in the middle, while extending infinitely on either side. If this model is correct, then the cosmos will appear to have a beginning at the midpoint where entropy reverses, but will continue on infinitely in either direction. This one explains not only why an infinite cosmos can appear to have a beginning, but also the apparently low entropy state of the universe. An absolute beginning is what most people mean by God. So is this an argument from popularity now? Most people mean God when they say absolute beginning, therefore if there was an absolute beginning it was God by virtue of the fact that that's what most people believe? Yet some atheists find the existence of an infinite number of other universes more rational than the existence of a creator. The thing is, we know that it is possible for a universe to exist, because we live in one. We have no reason to assume that it is impossible for other universes to exist in other locations in the cosmos or at other times, if time does indeed extend beyond our universe. But we have no evidence that points to the existence of a creator. So with this in mind, yes, it is more rational to believe in multiple instances of a thing that we know can exist than to believe in one instance of a thing which has never been adequately demonstrated to exist. Never mind that there is no empirical evidence at all that any of these unknown universes exists, let alone a thousand or a gazillion. Okay, so there's no empirical evidence for the multiverse, just as there is no empirical evidence for the universe creating God. So given two hypotheses which both have zero empirical evidence backing them up, which would you say is more likely? The one that involves multiple things that we already know for sure can exist in reality, or the one that involves essentially invoking magic as an explanation where our understanding breaks down? The conclusion that God exists doesn't require faith. Okay, then make with the evidence. I mean, it really shouldn't require faith, not if God actually wants us to believe in him, but thus far he seems to be relying on us having faith rather than actually giving any sort of evidence. Atheism requires faith. It takes faith to believe in everything coming from nothing. It takes only reason to believe in everything coming from God. <sighs> I can't believe this guy is actually a professor of philosophy. There's no way his understanding of the concepts here are actually as warped as he is presenting them. The it takes more faith to be an atheist argument breaks down to, I know you are, but what am I? Is that really the route you want to go for in this? Do we call school children rational when they respond to an insult with I know you are but what am I? Or do we call that childish? 
I mean, I guess it would have been helpful for him to define his terms here. What does he mean by faith? Now, I know the Bible defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen, and yes, I would agree that this is a bad way to come to knowledge, but are you prepared to disagree with the Bible about what faith is? Or do you agree that this is what faith is, but you disagree about it being a virtue? I wasn't expecting much out of a PragerU video, but I wasn't expecting it to be this bad. Usually they're pretty good at at least sounding like semi-intelligent arguments until you think about them, but this time, I guess not. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Matthew Miller, who says, You claim that you don't want to be worshipped by atheists, but if they come with offerings of Patreon money and cookies, would you really deny them, Rhino? Well, Matthew, I'm afraid you have it backward. I wouldn't allow someone who gave me money and cookies to worship me. In fact, I'd be more likely to worship them. I worship that which provides me with money and snacks. My patrons are more real to me than God, and so just by virtue of the fact that they exist, they are much more likely to be deserving of my worship, and they give me money, so I'm incentivized to worship them. One announcement before I go, I just launched a new podcast in which I read stories from the Bible to my daughter and get her reaction. She has not been raised in the church and she hasn't been exposed to these stories in the same way as most kids are in this culture, so I'm curious what her reactions will be. As of this recording, there's only one episode, I did Genesis 1 through 3, and she picked right up on the God being a jerk motif of the story. It's called The Bible Through a Child's Eyes, and I will be leaving links down in the description, but you should be able to find it in your podcast player of choice by searching for that name. Release schedule for that one will be every second Sunday. Thanks for watching, special thanks to my PayPal heroes this week, Charles, Joaquim, and Neil, and to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are more real to me than God ever was. If you'd like me to worship you, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time! As an example, in a survey of Austral As an example, in a survey of Australians As an example, in a survey of Australian Australians Ah Australians. Ah I suppose he means the come As an example, in a survey of Aust No. Put too much fucking emphasis on it.